Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, and welcome to our new Think Tech Hawaii series, Education Matters, where we will explore education-related topics that touch everyone, not just formal programs in K-12 and higher education, but also broader issues and information that affect our community. In the next few weeks, we'll have guests covering the Hei Coalition, the Hui for Excellence in Education, the Ui Hero Academy for Philosophy and Ethics in Education, and Phi Alpha Theta, the National Honorary History Society. And today I'm happy to welcome my very first guest, Levi Ho'okano, Director of Programs, and Christina Bay, Director of Continuing Education and Communication for the Hawaii State Bar Association. Welcome, Levi. Welcome, Tina. Hello. So glad to have you here. So I wanted to talk about lawyer education because as we all uh, no, living in a civil society like we do, we all have interaction with lawyers either on a direct basis because of some need, whether it's an accident or family estate planning issues or a criminal case, or indirectly in the day-to-day uh, -day life of taking care of or, or following rules, regulations, and laws. So tell us what the HSBA does in terms of making sure that our state, our community of attorneys, stays up to date on all the changes and challenges that come up through the law and through um, changes in the law and uh, court cases. So, Levi? So Carol, in 2009, the Hawaii State Supreme Court passed a rule, uh, Rule 22, which implemented our mandatory continuing legal education program for our lawyers that are licensed here in Hawaii. Uh, that rule mandated that we have to keep up with changes to our professionalism and our ethics rules. And then in 2015, they amended that rule to require us to learn substantive areas of law to apply towards our mandatory continuing legal education. So the first, so before 2009, lawyers did not, were not required to keep up with any changes. That's correct. We had, we had aspirational goals that were set forth by the Supreme Court and then in 2009, they passed the rule to be applicable in 2010, uh -huh. uh, mandat mandat mandating that we keep up with changes to the law for professionalism and ethics. Okay, and the types of courses you said 2015 it was changed to a certain, to include substantive. Yes, that's correct. And Before that it was voluntary legal education. I see, okay. And Tina, what um, you are the director of the CLE, which is continuing le legal education, right? So what does that mean? So the HSB tries to put on programs for the attorneys to complete these requirements with, so we offer all kinds of courses to help them stay up to date with on what's going on in the law, different topic areas, and to give ethics credits as well, because ethics is a very important part of being an attorney, being ethical, following the rules of professional conduct, and to be on par with those kind of things. So we offer classes to satisfy those goals. We have several coming up. This One coming up this month mm -hmm. is um, a CLE about Im immigrants. Uh, it's it's a, a, I forgot the title. Of okay, <laughs> well we um, have it right here. No, know Your Rights. Right. Know, know Your Rights Regarding Immigrants. It's a free CLE that's going to be offered to the members of the, of the bar to assist with their uh, clients who might need some guidance in that area. We also have another CLE coming up um, on April 18th called it Attorney Speech, What Lawyers Can and Cannot Say. That program is designed to um, help attorneys to watch their ethical rules and guidelines as they speak about their cases and clients to the public or other people that they might interact with in their day-to-day -day life. Okay, well let me ask you about these two. First, the immigrant one. Um, you said it's free. Yes. And is that a growing area of the law? Are there a lot of changes in the law that require our attorneys to um, be you know, informed about these changes? Well, with the new administration, there's a lot of change happening, and it's very important to stay abreast of what's, what's happening in the law. It's hard to predict what's going to happen, but we do want to keep attorneys abreast of what may happen and how to approach those things when they do occur. We also had a CLE last couple weeks ago on employment law, as that area is also bound for lots of changes just with the new administration. So we do our best to try to present courses that are timely and relevant to attorneys to keep them aware of what's going on. All right, so the immigrant uh, program then is not just state law, of course, it's federal federal yes. law. And so how, how of course, the uh, developing laws on the ban, for instance, the immigration ban that the uh, president is trying to impose, um, will that be included in the course? So this program is being put on by the primarily by the Diversity, Equality, and the Law Committee of the HSBA, which is shortened to DEAL because it is a long name. And their focus is to help 
create or provide diversity and equality in the law to people to provide um, assistance to those in need most. And so this program is free because we want to have attorneys to learn more about what they can do to assist these people who need help. Mm -hmm. And we are a co-sponsor with this, but the primary sponsor is the DEAL Committee. And DEAL, and what does that stand for? Diversity and Equality in the Law. It's uh -huh. a committee of the HSBA, uh -huh. which seeks to promote those issues in, in the public. I see, okay. So those are CLE. We'll cover some more of these um, programs uh, in just a minute. But Levi, so tell me more about your programs. Are yours, how are yours related to education? So in, in my department, mm -hmm. we focus on the outside providers uh, certifying their courses for continuing legal education for our members. So the State Bar Association, we're one of the providers that can um, give these educational classes to our members for their annual CLE credits, but we also certify other organizations to provide continuing legal education credits for our members. For example, uh, a law firm may want to sponsor their own in-house programs because they'll know what their attorneys need best. They'll submit an application to our organization to certify their program for continuing legal education credit for their members. The public defenders and the prosecuting office, they always do in-house programs. They certify it through our office to make sure that it complies with the Supreme Court rules and then they can provide their own instruction. And I know the law school does too, right? The law school as well. We partner with them for whenever they bring in guest speakers. They'll open it up sometimes to our members and we'll certify their courses for continuing legal education credit. We try to partner with as many people as we can to get those education credits out there so that our members are well educated on changes in the law. So about how many courses a year or a month do you provide to the... Uh, how many lawyers are there in the state of Hawaii? There's about... 8,000 attorneys, about 5,000 are active, uh -huh. I believe. Mm -hmm. And those 5,000 need to have continuing yes. legal education courses. Yes, they do. So how many a month do you provide or how do you measure it? The HSB, yeah. we try to provide at least one program a month. Mm -hmm. And we also have all of our, our live programs available to view on demand on online for our members to watch at their leisure. And so, and of course, neighbor islands, it's all Yes. yes. We work with our neighbor island bar associations. They're, you know, the Hawaii County Bar Association, West Hawaii, all of our neighbor island bar associations. We work with them to implement at least three credits per year on the neighbor islands so that we reach out to as many members as possible. Okay. And so some of these outside providers, Levi, can you give me an idea of some of the courses? We talked about the state bar courses on immigration and um, speech, but what would be some of examples of recent courses that maybe the law school or some of the other public defender's office provided? A lot of times, recently they'll be doing programs on cybersecurity. Ah, um, very which seems to be a very emerging topic for, um, for our, our members and for our lawyers, because oftentimes if we're advising large companies, um, public institutions, we want to make sure that our data is secured. We want to make sure that our, even our law firms are secured in their own data and what they're, what they're maintaining for their client files. So cybersecurity is becoming a big topic that other providers are, are bringing out. The State Bar Association, we actually just did too. one. The State for, Bar did one on mm -hmm, cybersecurity. Uh, well. Last month, we did a, a program on cybersecurity. And I know that, um, of course, every year there's the annual Hawaii State Bar Association Convention. And is that an opportunity for you to provide some programming, some courses? Yes. Yes. So the Bar Convention will be held on October 18th this year. It's an all-day program. Um, with the help of our sections, we provide quality programming throughout the whole day. It is open to the public. Primarily people from the bar will attend only, but we do encourage public people to come and join us to learn about different topics in the law as well. Um, but it is a big event. We really hope that more attorneys can participate to learn and to also participate in the monthly meeting, the annual meeting to learn about the Bar Association and what's going on. Mm -hmm. So every state has its own state requirements for continuing education. I guess some don't have any. Are there any federal requirements? There are, there are no federal requirements because the practice of law is primarily centered on the states. Mm -hmm. uh, each individual state will set its own requirements for continuing legal education. If there's any state that doesn't require it, I think it's only one maybe. But other than that, I'm pretty sure all states require some form of continuing education for its members. Let's see. So I think we have another program um, on Mandatory professionalism. Zuri, do we have that we can show? Uh, that's rule. Can you tell us a little bit about this program for the lawyers? Sure. Um, it's the rule 1.1 for Supreme Court mandatory professionalism course. The Supreme Court requires all new active attorneys to take this course within one year of becoming active. 
And it's a course to really set the groundwork about what the, your duties are as an attorney, as you practice law, how to assist clients, how to deal with your own business, how to, um, to carry on the difficult job of being an attorney uh, in, a, in a good way and professionally. So it's been put on, I'm not sure when it started, but the Supreme Court has required this and really we require it because it is so important that attorneys know how to maintain trust accounts and interact with their clients properly. And uh, so when is that course going to be offered? Oh, so we have, this is, but this is only for attorneys and we have, it's offered twice a year because it is required by the courts to attend. The first offering will be on June 10th and the second offering will be on, in the, on November 18th. I see. And there are half day programs in the morning. I see. So now how is this different from an ethics course then? Ethics credits are provided in this course. It's generally an ethics course. The idea behind it is we need to make sure that we all know how to follow the rules and not commit malpractice and do things that are not gonna are going to damage the reputation of attorneys and our clients as well. We want to protect the clients as much as possible. The whole purpose behind having CLA requirements by any state is to protect the, the consumer. We want to make sure that um, clients are getting the best quality quality service and are being protected all the time. So ethics comes into play there and our efforts to educate really goes toward consumer protection. Really, Have you seen a growth in, in the uh, field of ethics uh, and the law? I mean, I know in my day, oh, dating myself, <laughs> but we didn't have really an ethics course and certainly no ethics requirement on the bar. You know, this professionalism course, I mean, it's designed for the new attorneys. Uh -huh. um, you know, after you pass the bar and you meet all the requirements to get admitted to a, as a member of the bar, you have to take this course within one year of going on an active status with your license. So the idea is to set the groundwork right away with our new attorneys on what the standards are for practicing law in the state and uh, what they're, what's expected of them in their, in their field of choice. If there are any ethical violations, what happens? Is the public, how is the public protected? There's actually, there's, first there's the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. They are the primary gatekeepers for ethics and professionalism in the state for our, our, for our attorneys. We also have a um, committee on professionalism with, uh, within the state bar to examine and make sure we're staying up to date with current trends in professionalism and ethics. And members of the public can call in to the Office of Disciplinary Counsel if they have complaints about lawyers, um, whether it's their own or something conduct from the opposing counsel that may have run afoul of the professionalism rules. All right. Well, that's, that's very good to know. Um, we're going to take a quick break. But again, to reiterate, uh, ethics issues for lawyers are extremely important and for the public. And so there is a means for the public to um, contact a bar association, the old Office of Disciplinary Counsel to um, check what's going on. So we'll be right back with my uh, guests Levi and Tina Bay from the HSBA. We'll be right back. Aloha everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Are you looking to get shrunk? Join us on Shrink Wrap Hawaii. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I see couples, individuals, families, because you know why? Because we all have problems. And if you're curious about shrinks and what they talk about, come look at my show, Shrink Wrap Hawaii, and maybe you'll find your shrink. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee again with my first show with our new series, Education Matters. And my guests are Levi Holcano from the Hawaii State Bar Association and Tina Bay, also from the Hawaii State Bar Association. And they've both been lawyers and practicing and I've known them for a long time and <laughs> uh, appreciate your uh, coming to our first show. So we spent the first half uh, talking about the role of the Bar Association in keeping our own state lawyers up to date in terms of developments in the law, uh, ethical, uh, requirements and uh, ethical issues. So I thought we would spend this last uh, portion of the show to talk about 
how the lawyers in our state turn around and educate the public. So if you could give us a little uh, talk about that. And um, Suri, we have one last um, piece of uh, information to show, and that's a Leadership Institute flyer. So Levi, do you want to talk to us about that? Sure. I, you know, in, back in 2007, the, the Bar Association had a strategic planning meeting to really take a look at the future of our profession. And part of the, one of the major things that came out of that strategic planning meeting was the HSBA Leadership Institute. Um, that program was instituted in 2009, and this year we're taking applications now for our ninth class. So it's been around for a long time now, and it's developed every year. And the idea behind it is for our attorneys who are three to 15 years of practice. So pretty young attorneys, right? Fairly new. Fairly new um, attorneys. And the idea is to get to develop them in their leadership skills, with not only within the legal profession, but also within their communities. Because once somebody hears that you're an attorney, all of a sudden things go off in their brains and they see you in a different light. So attorneys, whether we like it or not, can be viewed as leaders within our communities just by the nature of our profession. The idea is that we get our members to meet with members of our judiciary, our business community, access to justice, um, the government, to develop them as all-around leaders. Uh, not, like I said, not just within the bar, but also within our, our own communities. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the program, the, our leadership fellows are required to de develop a program or a project that they have to complete before they actually finish the Leadership Institute. And so what kind of, uh, and I know Tina was a, a fellow. Uh, what year was that, 20? I was a 2014 15. fellow. Right, and uh, what kinds of projects do they work on? I know that, Tina, tell us about your project. Well, the projects are very broad, wide, broad range. They can work to assist the bar, but I think a good focus is to try to do things that are not in your regular um, realm of comfort and to try to help the community out. So whether it be starting up a program in a school to encourage voting or something like that, or um, all sorts of different topics can come up. I personally worked on actually a show for Think Tech um, <laughs> called The Living Legend Lawyers, and I was on the back side of this green screen, or it's not green on TV, sorry. Um, but if you're here, I was on the other side helping to memorialize the stories about our three-digit attorneys who um, are still surviving and have such great stories to tell about the old days when Hawaii was first admitted and just even prior to then what it was like to practice law and the path that they took to get here. I got to meet so many great people who are leaders in the community as well as the legal community and it was just a great learning experience for me personally and I hope that the program helps educate the public about the issues that attorneys have gone through as they've um, progressed in, in this, this career here in Hawaii and and just helps to encourage young people to maybe be consider pursuing the, the career of law. Mm -hmm. So Levi, this um, program then is open to young lawyers, you said between three and 15 years yeah. of experience and is there a charge? There is, um, we, there is a, a nominal fee mm -hmm. of $250. When there's, we also have an opportunity to um, apply for financial assistance if, mm -hmm. if needed. Um, we encourage all of our members to apply. Usually our fellows are a cross-section of our community. We have people from large law firms, small law firms, solo practitioners, yeah. government attorneys, neighbor island attorneys, nonprofits. and nonprofits, um, legal service providers. Mm -hmm. that we encourage everyone to apply. Do you have, you know, so what has happened to some of the earlier graduates? What kind of work have they gone out to do to <laughs> well, well, I'm actually a member of the first class, no 2009, kidding, Levi. of the Leadership Institute, and uh, I had a meeting uh, last week with one of my fellow alums. Uh, he was visiting from, from the mainland. After the Leadership Institute, he went to work for Apple in California, and then now he's actually in Connecticut practicing law out there with, the, with an insurance uh, firm. Mm -hmm. And so we've gone all over the place. Since then, some of my classmates have gone on to become general counsels at uh, some, of our, some of our businesses here in the state, um, heads of nonprofits, and gone on to some really great things. Since then, I've come to work for the State Bar Association. Yeah, that's wonderful. So in addition to the formal education of law school, having something like a leadership institute gives you another set of skills then to um, use your, combine the legal background and these leadership mm -hmm. skills to um, pursue something that might have a wider um, appeal. Yes. Some, some of our members, um, some of the graduates of the Leadership Institute and some of our, um, a lot of our other members are very active in our community. They try to reach out as much as possible. Um, our Young Lawyers Division 
actually does a lot to reach out to the community and educate the community about legal rights. They partner with our legal service providers like Volunteer Legal Services, Hawaii Legal Aid, and many of the other nonprofit um, legal per service providers to really reach out to the community so that they know some of their basic uh, legal rights when it comes to areas of landlord tenant, family law, immigration, and some of the uh, more mainstream legal topics. Right, so I know of course May 1 is Law Day. And yes, typically yes, you yes, hear yes. about the uh, uh, shopping centers that may have tables on those days. Mm -hmm. Well, what else do you do? What else does the Bar Association and the, the we might tell our viewers that there's a young lawyers, there's a uh, senior council, there's a senior senior council and then there's the in-between. There's everybody else. <laughs> well, everybody. we're all members of the bar. <laughs> right. So uh, what else besides uh, Law Day, May Day do you uh, do in terms of helping our community and besides well, these partnering with other well the senior council division is also active the senior council division goes has been going out to Molokai to talk to our the members of the public out there to do a clinic um, on Molokai because they don't have too many it's, lawyers it's tough, there you know to get to get assistance out there sometimes so our senior council division has been very good about doing that um, in addition we also assist the judiciary with the courts in the community program and what um, is that so the Supreme Court has decided that they want to reach out to, to high school students. And so what they'll do is they'll hold a Supreme Court hearing in a high school. In a the real community. hearing. A, a, a real, real case. A real case. And Everything is on the line. Attorneys will argue in front of the justices, in front of an auditorium full of high school students. So rather than having it at the Supreme Court downtown, they can officially move the, the court. court to a high school auditorium. Yes. Recently we held one at McKinley High School uh, last year. Um, and actually next month, We've, the Supreme Court will be going to Maui, and we'll be holding a Supreme Court hearing at Baldwin High School. No kidding. And so the students all attend, get to hear? Who, who is in the audience? High school. Students attend, and the students. great thing is volunteer attorneys will go to the classroom and actually teach the students about the course, the, class, the case that's being argued, so they have a really in-depth idea of what's going on. And they're, not, they're not just <coughs> passive listeners, but they're actually engaged in the argument themselves, and they can ask questions to the judges and the attorneys after the argument is done and get their insight about what their argument may have been. The well, attorneys have found it to be greatly inspiring to see the young, the young students out are so excited to learn this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the students are, have a great chance to really practice being an attorney from an early age and maybe perhaps get inspired to become an attorney as well. Boy, this is a very new development because I know they didn't do this in the old it's, days. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a few years. and. Um, you know, some of the students that I've heard mm -hmm. that attended the courts in the community program, when they would ask questions of the attorneys, their, the volunteer attorneys who were talking through the case with them, a lot of the things that they brought up within their classroom was brought up by the attorneys in the hearings. So it really reinforces, I think, with them that they're thinking like a lawyer, even mm -hmm. though they may not realize it at the time. So are they a specific type of cases? Because I imagine criminal cases you don't bring to the... Well, these are all Supreme Court cases? These are all appellate cases okay. in front of the Supreme Court. Um, they try to select cases that are, would be interesting to the students. The most recent one that they did at McKinley was a case about um, custodial interrogation, about whether somebody properly was read their Miranda rights before answering police questions in the marijuana case. Interesting. And so what happens, the deliberation happens, of course, after. Yes. And then do the students get um, informed? How do they get informed of the decision? Is that part of the education? Yeah, process? usually they'll get some kind of a notice that the case has been decided so they mm -hmm. can see how the court came down on a case that they witnessed being argued. Very exciting. And what about, so that's the high school students, and then we, of course you, you mentioned the uh, uh, senior bar going out to Molokai. Are there other areas besides, uh, let's say, the uh, community? Um, yes, the, the Young Lawyers Division, they, like, they, are, they do a lot of the community outreach. And on who are Young Lawyers? 30, the year that you turn 36 is their last year oh, as a young unless lawyer. You unless you've been admitted to the bar here for the first time. This, if, unless Hawaii is your first bar admission, you have five years of practice. So it's okay. possible to be both a member of the Senior Council Division and the Young Lawyers Division at the same time. So if somebody started law school in their 60s. If they have a second career, yes, they, they could be a member of both, both right. uh, sections at the same time. But, the Young Lawyers Division really does a lot of the community outreach on behalf of the bar, and of course they take volunteers from all ranges of the bar, not just a young lawyer can volunteer with the Young Lawyers Division. But they also do the Junior Judges Program. And what is that? That is where the, we'll have volunteer attorneys go and speak to third graders, to sixth graders, 
about making good decisions in their lives. They are the junior judge. So they, we talk to them about topics that they'll encounter every day, bullying, vandalism, um, cheating, mm -hmm. stealing, mm -hmm. a, a variety of topics that they're likely to encounter at some point while in elementary school. And so how is that lined up? Is it through the Department of Education or is it, uh, how do they find the schools and the classrooms to go to? We usually reach out to the schools. We'll send an email, uh, a letter out to the schools um, across the state to see if they'd be interested in participating. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult if their curriculum is already set. And we know that the school year is a tightly packed schedule. Um, so if they're able to fit us in, we'll be sure to go out there and, and talk with the students about these issues. So if we have viewers who are interested in participating, having the Bar Association come out to their schools, they should just contact they can reach out to us um, to the Young Lawyers Division, uh, yld at hsba.org, and then we can see if we can set something up. If they wanted to have us come and speak to a career day, we'll coordinate with some volunteer attorneys, talk about what it is that lawyers do and how the road to law school and some of their options. Great. So any other programs? We just have a, another minute here. Oh, we also have the high school mock trial program. Yeah, which is actually good. ongoing right now. We're actually in the, the very final stages of our high school mock trial program. Um, and, where and quickly, what is that? Our, our volunteer attorneys will work with the high school class. It's s separate from like debate and things like that, but they will run through a mock case. They'll argue it in front of the judge at the circuit court, and the finals will be held at the Supreme Court. Wow, what a, what a wonderful opportunity. Well, we just have a few more seconds, and Tina and Levi, you have an opportunity to look right into camera, too, and to tell our audience what parting words you'd like to have the, uh, our viewers know about uh, educating both two ways, how lawyers are educated and how we educate the public. Well, we have a lot of information available on our website, hsba.org. Um, we have two separate tabs on our website, one for lawyers to talk about our CLE programs and what kind of programs we have coming up in the future. As well, we have a tab for the public, where members of our public who are looking for legal assistance or legal information can click on those links and get the information that they need. Okay. So please visit our website, hsba.org, and browse around and contact us as you need to. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Levi. Thank you, Tina. And again, this is the first uh, show of our new series, Education Matters. And on behalf of, the, of ThinkTech, thank you so much for participating in today's program, and aloha.